get started, if you could just tell me your name and where you're from. I'm Robert L. Harris from Lilburn, Georgia. And do you remember your serial, serial number? No, I, I don't remember the serial number. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to, uh, if you could lean back a little more, because yeah, mm -hmm. is that okay for you? Yes, yeah, fine. It'll, it'll look better on camera. Okay. You lean over like that. All right. Okay. okay. You want to get a little closer to him, or does that help? As long as, I'm, long as I'm not in the... No, you're not in the... I, I think that's what it is. He's trying to talk to you. Okay. Um, so, um... That's looking good now. Did you always... Uh, were you born and raised in Lilburn? Uh, no, I was born and raised in Fort Valley, Georgia. Just a little sound, just below Macon. Tell me a little bit about growing up there. Well, of course, I th think back then the majority of the people lived in small towns. But they were where the principal activity was farming, and Port Valley is noted for his peaches. We, uh, I went to high school. Of course, just one. They had a grammar school and a high school in Port Valley. I was born on a farm outside Port Valley. At the age of nine, we moved into town, and uh, we uh, during the during the summer, all these school kids. That uh, most of them worked in peaches. You could start working peaches the day after school, and it usually lasted through the month of July. And we would we'd still have a break for summer from July to, to September when school started. But uh, of course, back then, before World War II, uh, not many people uh, they didn't do much traveling. I think the war World War II made people in the United States more mobile than ever before. But uh, people back then very seldom would go out of the state or maybe go to Florida, but they didn't travel like they do now. Um, tell me a little bit about what you were doing before Pearl Harbor. Well, of course, I was, was still in high school before Pearl Harbor. I didn't uh, graduate until I was, was just before I was 18. I missed a year out of school. I had some sort of meningitis when I was eight years old. I missed a year out of school and never did make it up. So when I graduated from high school, I, I was, June, I was 18, May of 30th, and, and was in the Army by the end of July. So uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't volunteer back then. After, after Pearl Harbor, they wouldn't let you volunteer because they had to meet their uh, quotas for uh, enlistments. And they waited until you were drafted. So, I, of course, I knew it was about to soon be drafted. So I went into, right out of high school, I went into the Army. What made you decide to go into the Army rather than the other services? Well, uh, if you didn't, of course, you couldn't vol volunteer at that time. But you just you were just drafted, and uh, I don't think you had much choice. I, at least I didn't have any preference. Um, when you when you where were you and um, what were you doing and what did you think? What was going through your mind when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I think everybody at that time remembers what they were doing when they heard about Pearl Harbor. Some of the fellows and I were out uh, on the edge of town in a motel that one of the uh, fellows' family owned, and we would, and uh, I, I remember a cousin of mine, this girl, came out and told us that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, and uh, it was just a, a strange feeling, the feeling that you knew it was going to affect your life in the future. Didn't know to what extent, but you knew that it was, it was going to be have, have a drastic effect on your life. It was just a terrifying thing that uh, to have something like that happen, and I I think everybody felt that it was uh, something that was would be drastic changes as a result of it. Um, so once uh, you went to the army, um, where did you train? I trained in uh, Fort Jackson, went in, inducted and kept Fort Pearson in Atlanta and uh, was shipped to Fort Jackson. And uh, I was, was supposed to go to an infantry training camp, but the camp had been set up, so I was put in an MP uh, outfit that was slated to go overseas. And when they received orders, they lined us up one Monday morning and told us that, that, the, uh, that they were gonna start transporting true, uh, prisoners back from the port to the camps that were not going overseas. So five of us went when the they dismissed us. Five of us went down to the headquarters and volunteered for the infantry. And by Wednesday, we went our way to the infantry, and I joined the 78th Division in Camp Pickett. And at Camp Pickett, they were training to go overseas, and, and, and we had extensive training. And 
went overseas in, sep in the following September of that year. And which year was that? Um, 1944. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's time. It's scrubbing so the it is it over? Yeah. No, okay. So that, I'm sorry, that was what year? Uh, let's see, that was uh, 1944. Okay. Um, and then they shipped you overseas. Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and where you went. Uh, well, we went to Melbourne, England, and stayed in England two weeks. Then we took a, a foreign ship over to Le Havre, France, and uh, we t then we took some trains to Belgium. And uh, from there, we went to combat in Belgium. This, this was after the uh, after the invasion that we we went over right soon after the invasion, and we went in combat in in Hurricane Forest in uh, November 1944. Um, a lot of people don't really know that much about the Hurricane Forest. Could you tell me a little bit about that battle and your experiences in it? Well, it was a battle that never really never should have occurred. According to what, what I read, the Germans win this forest, and uh, instead of just bypassing the forest, they decided to go in and, and get the Germans out. And it was a lot of fierce fighting. And one thing that made it so difficult was the weather. It was extremely cold, and of course, in the forest, it, it made it made it worse. They they are still fi finding uh, bodies where GIs had died in the forest. In fact, I read something a couple of years ago where they found a a GI and a German buried in the same grave. So it was uh, the, uh, they were just a, just a difficult situation because of the weather and the vista of the forest. You, you, you could be walking through the forest, they would cut paths, clear out areas and have a machine gun lined up. And if you walked in that area, you'd get, uh, get cut down with machine gun fire. And it, uh, it was just a battle that should, that should never have been fought. Um. So you joined the seventy. You were in the seventy eighth Infantry Division. Yes. Uh, what other smaller units were you in? Uh, well, that was the only unit I was in. I was just in, in a rifle company, in uh, Company B, Seventy Eighth Infantry Division. What uh, What was your job there? Well, uh, when I started out, the first uh, attack we made in the Hurricane Forest, I was uh, my company led the attack, and I was a uh, group of three in an automatic rifle group. They call them VER group. They would have the gunner carry the BER. The BER was a weapon you could put on a stand and it uh, fired about 1,200 rounds. A, no, I believe it was 550 rounds a minute. And it carried, you had to carry magazines, so they had an assistant. And his job was to pick up the BER in case the BER man was shot in an ammo barrel. And I was the ammo barrel. And, uh, that morning we made our attack, we moved up at night, and the German shelled us all night, they knew we were coming up. Then the next morning at day daylight, we attacked over the hill. And that uh, is really a strange feeling when you re realize that after all the training that you, that they really do, do shoot at you, that you bullets whizzing by and you realize this is, this is it. And it's really a, a, a funny feeling. But the uh, ammo, the, B.R. man was the first man one killed in our division, and his uh, assistant was hit in the chest, and I picked up the B.R. and I carried it for a good while. I, I didn't weigh but 125 pounds at the time, and it weighed 20 pounds, so I, they would give it to a larger person occasionally. But uh, but as I, w I went in, I made sergeant later on, but I was most of the time I carried the automatic rifle. Was it was all that weight worth the firepower? Well, we would leave the tripod off. I didn't carry the tripod, but uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the firepower of the VR. It was it was a good weapon. So it was worth worth carrying it. Every squad carried one. Um, you were talking about how the the training uh, about, about some of your training. Do you do you feel that your training prepared you for what you met in combat? Well, I I had some extensive training with the MP outfit, and I think the fact that I had training there plus the training with the uh, 78th Infantry Division uh, gave me a little advantage and probably the reason that uh, I was able to survive. Um, 
What about mail? Did you get mail very often from home? Uh, well, while we in, while we in camp, of course, we had mail calls every day, but on the front line, it was you didn't uh, really receive mail too often. I know my family would send, they would uh, send me uh, candy in cans, boxes of my, some of my uh, mother's sisters, and we stopped one time on the Rural River. We had captured a dam on the Rural River, and they brought the mail up, and I got five boxes of, of uh, canned candy and, and different things, also like to fix hot tea, and they'd send me tea bags, and, and uh, they delivered these five bags, and before I even opened them, they told us to pull out. And so I just left the five, five patches in the woods on the real river. But we, uh, we wouldn't get, get mail too often. It's all like the meals. Uh, they, they would try to get meals up to us when they could. But it was, uh, at times, it was just impossible. I remember one time they brought a meal up to us. It was at, at night, and uh, of course we couldn't have lights, and it was raining. And we would line up in the woods, and we'd go. They'd set up a, a mess line, and in order to know where a mess kit is, they'd grab our wrist and put the food in the mess kit. And of course, they didn't know how they put it in. You didn't know what it was, and the coffee cup would fill up. And but they did a good job of getting meals to us. But often it was very not very often they could get get the meals to us. So in fact, going to rule uh, the Clone Plains when we were uh, going to. Um, to the Ryan River, the uh, at the reunion a couple of years ago, I asked some of the fellows if they remember eating and sleeping, and nobody even remembered eating or sleeping for the, for the two weeks that we were on the Clone Plains, taking the drive to the to the Ryan River. Um, <clears throat> when tell me about the first time you were actually in combat. Well. Uh, it was in the hurricane forest we moved. We were moving up, and the Germans realized that we were coming up, so they, they, they were shelled us. I think we uh, had three or four people hit that night. They were, we were, they, uh, I don't know how long the shell seemed like it was all night. And uh, the next morning, we made our attack. And that, uh, that's the time that uh, I took on the BR, that the BR man was killed. And, the first man in our country was killed, and the uh, the uh, his assistant was hit, was hit in the chest. And I took over the BER, but it's uh, it's just a feeling you can't describe when you realize that you that you up there and, and being shot at, and uh, that that you you know you you're going to be up there until something happens. I, even with the training I had, I didn't realize when you went on the front line, you just you were just that night and day. I thought you'd go up and come back for a while, and but uh, when we went on the front lines that that morning, we were there till the end of the war. The only relief we had is one time I went back to a rest camp, and that was the only relief from the front line that you had. And when you're up there a long time, and you have people around you to be killed and you feel like that, uh, in fact, I was reading something that long ago, it said that a lot of the veterans now are guilty of the fact that they had so many of their friends killed in World War II and they really feel guilty about it. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Because I oftentimes think of some of the fellows that I had a lot of respect for and that were, were killed and uh, you, you just feel like that, after a while you just feel like you know that you're, that you're gonna be next. You, you can't uh, last very much longer. What was morale like under those conditions? Well, we would have, uh, we had several fellows that would, would, they would shoot themselves, and, but usually morale was, was good. The, the, uh, there was, a, I think every outfit had enough, some people, men in it that uh, were more interested in doing their jobs and, and didn't have, had little regard for their own safety, not regard for it, but they did job, doing the job was more important than their own safety, and I think they had an influence on the others, and and uh, they, they, uh, they, they, the others just sort of followed the example set forth for these these men. There were several like that, that they seemed to be up there doing anything, and they were really good example for the others. Um, <clears throat> when you were in the Hurtgen Forest, um, 
foot slogging infantry, uh, like you said, at the front lines of everything. At that point, did you ever think about what you were fighting for or what did you think you were fighting for? Well, I uh, of course, we, if we would we uh, think what we're fighting to, to uh, save Europe from being overrun with the uh, Germans. And I think that we'd realize that if we, if we didn't, if we didn't win the war, that uh, that Hitler would take over Europe. And I feel like if we hadn't, of course, he would have taken over the, the Middle East, and no telling what condition the world would be in now, if we had allowed him to to uh, to conquer Europe. And I feel that if we haven't intervened, that they that he would have would have conquered Europe. Do you think that was the same opinion you held in 1940? Yeah, yes, I think I think I had that same opinion. Um, did you ever come into contact um, with any British soldiers? The British soldiers? Mm -hmm. Yes, we we uh, fought with British soldiers uh, soldiers at, at uh, on uh, let's see, in, we took Smith Germany. We had some help from British at that time. What did you think of the British? Well, I didn't have any special contact with them, but uh, but they are a little more deliberate, and and uh, I don't think they they certainly what uh, didn't have the uh, ego that that Patton had the way he would advance. But they were a little more cautious. We considered that they were extremely cautious, and and we would joke about the stopping having tea every afternoon, but. Uh, but I think they were good, good soldiers from the experience I had with them. I certainly want to go into <laughs> what you thought about the Russians, but uh, we'll, we'll do that in a little bit. Well, we had, so had we were very led, and there were Russians, Russians there. Um, let's see. So, of all the of all the uh, the combat that you saw, do you remember what the most intense instance was? Well, there were two. two uh, uh, we took one town on the Earth Canal that uh, we uh, lined up on the edge of the wood. In fact, we had resistance coming up to the town the night before. We had several men killed with by patrols, but uh, at daylight we lined up on the edge of this woods. We, we uh, had a dirt park the night before we moved up the edge of the wood. Dirt park told waiting for dawn, and it, when the sun came up, it was a real pretty day in March. And there's a long field going down to a, a small canal called the F Canal, and the town was on the hill beyond this canal, just beyond the other side of the canal. And uh, we all uh, had foxholes, and uh, I was in the foxhole with a fellow from Montgomery, and he, he was shot th in, through the head that morning. But we, st uh, when it, the word came for us to move forward, we would advance towards the town and it started running and they started shooting. Uh, my division, they went by the theory that uh, the best way to do is to rush the enemy and keep shooting and keep their heads down. Because if you try to advance by just hitting the ground and moving forward inch, you know, yard by yard, that you would lose more men that way than just rushing and, and getting it over with. So that's what we did. We lined up and, and rushed, ran across this field. I remember that was the only time that I really thought I was going to, going to get hit. I was going across that field that morning. And uh, I don't remember exactly how many we had in the squad. We'd lost some the night before, but uh, when, when we, went, we didn't have three men left in the squad at, when we reached that town. But we did, we did take the town, and we had lost a lot of men. The next time at the Remagen Bridge, we, uh, uh, I was lying near a tank on the, on the uh, going from the Remagen to, I mean going to the Remagen across the Clone Plains. According to the book, we averaged uh, 21. Mi we walked 21 miles a day because we rode tanks a good bit too. But we averaged 21 miles a day for 12 days, and we they kept telling us when we reached, took the last town on the Rhine River, that it would take six months before we could be able to go across the river. So we were all anxious to get to that last town so that we could. Could rest because we'd been going, but, but we'd been going at a pretty fast pace, and we were taking the last town. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. I was lying in the, by a ditch by a tank, 
and I heard a message come over the tank to pull back. And we pulled back and they put us on trucks and, and we went to the schoolhouse and had they fed us a hot meal. Then we, we got back on the trucks and took us to Remagen. And we got off the trucks, walked to the railroad track and crossed the Remagen Bridge. It was about two or, two or three o'clock in the morning. And uh, we, the Germans were on the other side of the bridge and, and we captured the train bringing the dynamite up to blow, blow, down, blow the bridge up. And the next morning we had went up in the hills and uh, expecting a counterattack from the Germans, which, which they did counterattack. But uh, the, that was the largest concentration of anti-aircraft fire in World War II was at the Remagen Bridge. We were on top of the hill, at, at, uh, I guess it was probably two mornings later. We, uh, we had been pinned down with, with some Germans uh, counterattacking, and the fire from these an aircraft guns trying to shoot the planes, the German planes were trying to bomb the bridge. And the anti-aircraft cover just, fire would just come over the, right over the top of the hill, and they would shoot planes down. It, uh, I think that was the most, uh, most action that I saw. Was the uh, most dramatic action, rather. Now, was the uh, was the action Ramagan what you're wearing the presidential unit citation for? Uh, well, it probably was. I, I don't. I, I imagine it was. I just I've forgotten what that what that citation is for. Um, after you crossed um, at Ramagan, well, actually, let me ask mm -hmm. you a, a question about that. Um, I know some some folks at home then, and several books now that I've read have talked about. Well, after after the Battle of the Bulge, Hitler was finished, and it was just a matter of time, and Germany mm -hmm. was weak. Um, mm. Did you get that sense at all? <laughs> well, yes, I, I I think we we all knew that the, the war was closing, but it was ending. But the, the Battle of the Bulge was his his last effort. The Battle of the Birds, they came came through three miles below us, and we could hear the tanks moving up. And uh, the the night before they attacked, on our foxholes, flowers were drifting over our flocks, foxholes, and we could hear tanks moving. So we knew that something was going on. But they they went through right below us, and and we kept complaining that uh, that our anti-aircraft, our artillery was falling falling short, and. They said that the Germans were behind us, shooting at us from behind, so they had had us practically cut off during the Battle of the Bird. We were, but we didn't actually do any fighting because the Germans were right across the field from us. But we didn't we didn't do any actual fighting during the Battle of the Bird. But I guess we were in a sort of a thing out in the in Germany because we they had fixed uh, foxholes back so that we we'd be able to treat to the new foxholes to the new uh, new area, but. Uh, we we didn't we didn't didn't have to. Um, <clears throat> so after you get across the bridge at Ramagan, um, what tell me tell me about what happened after that? Well, the next uh, project we had was we cut the uh, 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 the main highway. The uh, the I, I bought, let's see, forgetting what they call it. Anyway, that main highway to going through German, German the, the uh, Autobahn, Autobahn, yeah. We cut the Autobahn, and uh, from then we went on to, uh, that, that was, we went to the, we were in the rural pocket. That was uh, German, some German divisions that they had surrounded, and and we, uh, and we were in the rural pocket cleaning, capturing the, the division that was, was cut off in the rear pocket. Um, with, with the combat you saw and the experiences that you had, um, how did you feel about your your enemy, your, your German enemy at the time, and has that changed over the years? Well, I, don't, I, I know was, uh, after we crossed the Rhine River, I went back to the hospital for a couple of weeks. My feet had uh, split open being wet so so much. And uh, when I was coming back through France, a friend of uh, or another fellow and us, we, we, uh, I was in the hospital on the other side of Paris for two weeks. 
And when I came back to the front line, we went to, we stopped in Paris by overnight. And this fellow and I decided we'd go to, out and see if we could uh, find some donuts or something. And we went to this bakery. And the young girl in the bakery ran up the steps, wouldn't wait on us. The mother came down and apologized, said her, her daughter's mad with American soldiers because she ran her boyfriend out of town. So that sort of, <laughs> I think that uh, sort of led me to thinking, well, you know, it's really not uh, any different from, from anybody else, the German soldiers. And I think the German people were just, you know, they, Hitler had, had brought prosperity to them. They were in a recession, and I think the, the German people, was, that, well, they had no choice but to go along. They were having a good, better life than before. And uh, they had de developed the army, and they wanted uh, more land. I think they, needed, they wanted to car to, to the sea, and so I think it just started, started that way, but I really didn't have any modesty towards it. German people. Uh. Um, how much, <clears throat> if anything, did you hear about going on in the Pacific? Well, we uh, really didn't hear too much about it. We, the, we had this uh, publication, Stars and Stripes, that they would bring around to the foxholes, and we would get, we would, uh, they'd tell us via history of what our division is doing, and there would be a little in there about the Pacific. But we really didn't hear that much about uh, really what was happening in the Pacific. I guess you didn't hear that much about what was happening a mile down the line. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we were slated to go to the Pacific. We we in the rural pocket. We entered the pocket about the two weeks before the war ended. We were training to go to the Pacific. As I understand, we were one of three divisions that that uh, were to hit the the uh, Japanese mainland. So we, we were preparing for that when the war ended. Um, and, and, and tell me about, first tell me about VE Day. Well, it, uh, okay. Sorry. Get that mic drifted over there. Was it doing the size of going to again? Well, VE Day uh, was really un uneventful when we heard that the war had ended because everybody was shooting the rifles off and uh, we were in a small town in Germany. We, well, we were not on the front line at that time. And that was <coughs> about the only celebration we did was uh, shoot our rifles in the air and all that the war was over and we'd soon be going home. But <coughs> we moved to, uh, to Berlin and I think we all had to stay longer than we were supposed to. We had the point to come home. but. Once you went bed in, you couldn't leave until you had a replacement. Now, do you know why that was? You mean why we in Berlin? Why, 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 why you couldn't leave Berlin? Well, it was in Russian territory, and uh, you, you, you had to have a replacement before you they would let you go. This, this will be a good time. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about some of your run-ins with the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally didn't have any experience, bad experiences with the Russians, but uh, in Berlin. We weren't allowed to carry uh, firearms in Berlin because the Russians could, and uh, the uh, Russians. Uh, uh, there were several times that they they shot some of the G the GIs, and we we, we were real uh, cautious of being around the Russians. The uh, we were near Templehof Airport, and there was an area between the Russian line and the uh, at our line that. Uh, we saw we called sort of dead man's land. It looked, you know, neither neither side was in there, and uh, nobody would go in that area because the Russians they would uh, they they would if they could catch you off by yourself, you know, they they, they would uh, beat you up or shoot you. We we didn't have much respect for the for the Russian soldiers. Um, tell me about Berlin. Tell me a little bit about Berlin um, after VE Day. Well, we uh, 82nd Airborne was in Berlin right after the war. We relieved 82nd Airborne in uh, I think October of uh, 40, 44. And uh, uh, let's see, the, yeah, I guess 44. And we stayed in a, we were stayed in a large apartment house, like I said, right near Temple Off Airport. But it uh, we principally just. Uh, 
did guard duty around our our post and our as sergeant of the guard. I think about once every every week or something, or every two weeks. I'd be sergeant of the guard and responsible for the all the guards reporting to me that that they were in place. And we had guard posts out along the. Uh, also had guards out but on the edge of the city between the border, uh, Russian border. But it uh, really wasn't that uh, too eventful in Berlin. The town was was a uh, lot, lot of damage to the town. I know my stra scrapbook that I left with the, the historical society, I, had, I would try to get pictures of an area that before the war, and then I take a picture after the war to show how it was how much destruction there was, like the the tear garden and the Bramberry Gate. They had pictures of before the war and after the war. But it's, it's a real interesting city. I'd, I would uh, like to go back. I was back over in '89. They put a plaque for my company on the Remagen Bridge, and I went over for the ceremony in '89. And some of them going to Berlin. I didn't go, but I wish I could have gone back. I think it was a real pretty city. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me what sort of what sort of emotions you had, um, what sort of experiences you had when you went back over there and, and saw some of the, the things you had seen 40, 50 years earlier. Well, it, it, was, uh, it was a real interesting experience. We went back to land in uh, England as, as we did, did before and then took took a ferry across the canal and went to some of the cemeteries and I did see in fact I remember there's one person in my squad I didn't know what had happened to him and I saw his cemetery I was his grave in one of the cemeteries uh, but and uh, we went to the town Lammersdorf we first town where we uh, made our first attack we visited there and uh, went to Smith and uh, while we were, we were in Smith, uh, we had a, uh, a hard time taking Smith because it was the gateway before the small the small Michael Dam that we took, and we wanted to take this dam because they could flood some of the areas that we we had occupied if they broke the, if they dynamited the dam. So we had to take it, and they they put up a tremendous defense. In fact, it had been taken before, and they recaptured the town. And we, would, we took the town for the second time and they lost a lot of men there. And I was standing outside of the bus taking a picture of a church there that I remembered was there before. And uh, the town was pretty much destroyed in World War II. There was hardly, hardly any building standing. And a fellow came out of a cafe on the corner and, and uh, came over to him and said, we would like for you all to come in and, we, uh, and see some maps. So we all went over there, and the German officer that had defended the city was there with his maps, and he showed us his maps and how he defended the city, and we spent several hours there in that pub with these, with the Germans. But that's, uh, but I, I, in, in, I enjoyed going back. I don't, uh, don't think I care too much about going back again, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I went that one time. Tell me just a little bit about um, back during during wartime, uh, or just after VE Day, about um, your thoughts on the German civilian population. Well, we we were in a little town called Sand Germany before we moved into Berlin, and uh, we had to take we lived in a house had to take the house, of course, from the civilians and and. Uh, we, my company was on, on one, one, one street. We'd taken all the houses on that street. These Germans, of course, they, they, they would come back every day and clean up the house and make sure we weren't doing it, have, it weren't destroying the house. And but we got along well with the civilians in the small town. When we moved to Berlin, we didn't have much contact with civilians as we did with the, in the small town. But uh, like I said the civilians, all they knew what. I think was that they, during the war, they were able to get jobs and things were better than it was before the war. So they, uh, we, we really didn't have any have any problems with them. Um, what's the most powerful memory you have uh, 
of your life during the war? Well, the, the thing that I, brings back most memories is the fact of the cold weather. When you you went on the front lines, as I said before, you, you were on the front lines to stay. And we went in the face of the winter. And uh, all during the winter, I didn't even, didn't see a fire. And it was very few times that, that I was even in a, a building and just out the cold all the time. And uh, I remember one time, in fact, this another, we had two, there were three of us from Georgia in our company. And this fellow and I had a fox hole. It was during the, during the breakthrough. And of course, we would, uh, we would try to, we had, we could put a shelter, a poncho over the top of the fox holes. We decided we'd warm the fox hole up. So they would, had given us these little cans of canned heat, we call it. And you could light it and uh, walk with a cup of coffee or cook, heat something with it. So we decided we'd heat, up, heat our foxhole up. We had a foxhole behind a stump. The gentleman just cost a field. So we put, pulled a blanket up. I had a blanket, I guess. We pulled a poncho up over the opening of the foxhole and lighted this can of uh, uh, canned heat. And there, we probably looked like a Christmas tree out there not with the snow because the next thing we knew that an uh, 88 shell hit on the other side of that stump and almost knocked us out of the foxhole. So we didn't try that anymore. But uh, it, I think the cold weather was the thing that I, I recall most and most the, the worst experience I had was in during the cold weather over there. Because you were in it all the time and just no, no way out of it. What type of clothing did you have to try and keep warm with? Well, I, uh, we just had our regular uh, wool trousers. Uh, uh, we didn't wear fatigues. We did, had the uh, a field jacket and the wool dress pants. And I did have a a, sw a sweater that, that the Red Cross had sent over. I got it from a pill box and uh, also had a mask that they had given us. You know, a mask you can put over your face with just eye. See through the eyes, I had one of those that I wore quite a bit. But we weren't allowed to wear overcoats because the German soldiers had, had captured a lot of our overcoats and we were supposed to shoot anybody with an overcoat on, so so we didn't <laughs> we didn't wear overcoats. But it there was just no it was, it was the funny thing about it is nobody had colds. In in fact I was worried with sinus trouble in high school. I'd miss a couple of days from couple of weeks from school with sinus trouble every year. But after that winter, I never had a sign of sinus trouble any longer. But uh, the, your feet would get so cold. We, we had leggings when we first went in the, in, on the front line. And those leggings would get wet. And I remember taking my shoes all down the foxhole and just rubbing my feet and almost crying. They were hurting so much from the cold. But I guess being in it day and night, you uh, you sort of got used to it, but it's the thing that I remember most when it, doing cold weather here, it gets snow or something, it reminds me of the front line, and I think about the the conditions that we lived in over there, in those foxholes. I think it was the coldest one in 20 years, that one, and it, uh, it was really cold. Are we going to get on tape with you just on both of us? Uh, yeah, um, each camera is isolated to a different tape machine, so we're getting both. Okay, but I mean, we're not running that like I know they, the other ones were just 33 minutes. Uh, hold on. Let me time remain. Okay, we got 25 minutes remaining. Okay. Um, well, you were, uh, you were talking about you thought you were going to have to go over and take part of the invasion of Japan. Um, tell me a little bit why you didn't have to. Well, the, the atom bomb dropped, we, the, the war ended, so so we didn't have to go. We, we were slated to go to, over to invade Japan, so I understand. What, um, I'm sure you've, you've read about all the recent controversy in the last five or so years about the dropping of the atomic bomb. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Should we have, should we not have? Well, I've always d had the opinion that uh, that as many civilians as we killed with the that, that with the atom bomb that that we probably should have dropped it as a warning. But I suppose that if we had of it, there'd been a lot of protests in the 
United States if we hadn't have gone on and used the atom bomb and ended the war. So I, I think by doing that, it really saved a lot of lives. Because if we had to invade the mainland of Japan, I think there would have, you know, been a fierce fight, and that uh, we would have lost a lot of people. So I, I think as 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 uh, terrible as it was, I, I think I would have hated to have had to make the decision to drop it. But I, I think we did the right thing. Um. After the war ended, and uh, what, what did you do after the war? Well, I, uh, like I stayed in, in uh, the Army longer than I had. I had points to come home, and when I finally uh, came home in March of uh, 45, I, went to, uh, I started in the University of Georgia the following fall and, and graduated from the University of Georgia. How did you pay for that? Well, of course, I had the GI Bill. That, paid for the tuition, and I worked during the summer at uh, Blue Ridge Body Company in Fort Valley, building school buses during the summer. And they did the work, most of the work during the summer, and there was always a, a job available. Um, how often since then, uh, between then and now, have you thought, did you, how often do you think about your time in service? Well, I, uh, well, think of it pretty often. I, in fact, uh, last night a fellow from w one of my friends from the Army called. We we meet once a year. We started t uh, 12 years ago. And uh, in fact, a meeting this year, is, I'm sponsoring it at Stone Mountain. And last year we met at Myrtle Beach. And we have met in Toss and different places during the around the country, we, we meet where we where members live so they can arrange, make the arrangements. And uh, we we, uh, we had about 40 men that were meeting with us because our company, we had so many coming through our company, that I guess there must have been, well, there's, we have well over uh, 100 on our list that we contact, but usually just about 40. But of course now we just, they've been, We've, been, we've had deaths in, among the members, and usually about 20, 15 to 20 is all we can expect now. But we do meet once a year, and then the ones that are uh, still living, we, we contact each other. And uh, b But before that, we didn't have any contacts. The only, the only person that one I contacted when I got out of the Army was a fellow that uh, he had, uh, he was sick, he had a sickness, and I was carrying his rifle one day, and when we were going to make an attack, we were running across the fields. The Germans were shooting us for 88s, and I was carrying his rifle. So I turned to him and told him, I'm not carrying your rifle anymore. And he walked away, said, well, I'm going back. He said, I'm too sick to go on. So he started back, and uh, I ne nobody knows, knows what happened to him. He was never heard from him again. And I did write to him tr when I got back to see if he was still living, didn't hear anything from him. But I didn't attempt to, meet, to write to any of the others, or contact any of the others, because I thought, well, they just wanted to forget the war and not, uh, not to have any you know, remembrances. But when they started started the reunion, some of the guys uh, started the reunion, we, we uh, were glad they started and enjoyed, enjoyed getting back with them. There's a lot, a lot of guys with that fit they had a lot of respect for, and it, uh, and it was good to get him back with them and get them to get them to know them better. What kind of effect has World War II, World War II and your experiences um, had on your life personally? Well, I don't uh, don't know re really any lasting effect that it, that it had. I don't uh, really can't don't know that it really changed my life all, all that much. I think it would have. I would have gone to college, you know, had a night had a GI Bill, had not gone to the army, and uh, so I, I don't know as, as far as my personal life is concerned that it's really had that much effect on it. Um, what do you um, want future generations to understand and know um, about the sacrifices made by your generation during the war? Well, I'd like for them to understand that uh, 
I think, well, one thing is, is back in World War II, everybody wanted to do their part. And uh, like I say, I volunteered to go overseas because some of my friends were over there from Fort Valley. And uh, I wanted to do as much as they did to, to help the war effort. And back then, if you weren't in the Army, everybody, they wondered why you, you know, they would think something's wrong with you. Why weren't you in the Army? And you were expected to be in the Army if you were of that age. And everybody wanted to do that part. And uh, of course, it was it was it was hard, and uh, most people, you know, didn't complain about it. I think the cold weather was just it was something we just had to put up with, and uh, the army army life. Of course, you'd hear people complain about the food occasionally, or something like that. But I don't think they, I think the army really did an excellent job in and taking care of the uh, soldiers during the war. Do you think that the United States of 2004 has lived up to the sacrifices made by the United States between 1941 and 45? Well, y yes, I think so. I think we uh, we saved the, the the world back then from Nazi oppression, and and I think that we're the world's leader now, and I think we're living up with it. I I don't I don't think that we can allow anybody to do what what Hitler did during World War Two, and uh, the Holocaust. I don't uh, the only, the reason it occurred because people didn't think that that uh, human beings were capable of doing things like that. I know during the Holocaust, evidently, uh, they didn't really didn't know what was going on, and they, that Hitler was doing doing that. And not only did he have the the uh, that uh, camps that uh, he was killing people, the uh, concentration camps, but he also had labor camps. That we went to a town called Wuppertal, we took, and they had a labor camp there. They were most of them were Polish, and they were just forced labor. They had that for a factory, manufacturer, operator factory. And I think it's, since we're the world's leaders, I think it's, it's up to us to see that oppression such as that never occurs again. Obviously, the World War II had vast um, influences on the United States, uncountable and far-reaching. Um, what one or two uh, do you think are the most significant? Well, I think th it affected the, the workforce quite a bit because back in World War II, there were jobs that women thought never thought they could do, and they ended up doing during the war. They were welders and did just every job you could think of. And I think that has carried over to the day where w w women now are in the workforce, and I think it started during World War II that they saw that they could perform as w well as men. and and they uh, have entered the workforce. I think that's probably the biggest effect it's had on our economy is the fact that they, the result of World War II, that the women, more women are eager to enter the workforce. But I think that's, that's about the, as far as the economy, that's about the major effect, I think. What about the, the Civil Rights Movement? Do you think that that grew directly out of experiences from the war? Oh, well, I, no, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't think so. It certainly had a, a large effect on it. But I think, it would have, I think that would have developed anyway. I think that would have occurred. That's nearing the end of my questions. I guess the only thing is, is there anything we haven't talked about um, in this session that you think is important uh, that you'd like to talk about? Well, uh, no, I can't think of anything that uh, that I think we need to, need to bring that we haven't uh, mentioned. All right. Um, I guess that's about it. Thank no you okay. for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We can go one question you asked um, yeah, go ahead. about um, what I'm trying to do right now. Which one? 